Okay, we have uh, the opportunity once again, it's uh, been some time to have Zubin Austin with us join us. Zubin uh, originates from Canada. He is on the faculty at the University of Toronto uh, in the School of Pharmacy, and Zubin is always a great pleasure, stimulates our thinking, and uh, Zubin, without any further ado, you can find his resume. Once again, so I get a check mark, uh, you will see the QR code to make sure you uh, do the evaluation at the end. Zubin, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for the introduction and for uh, inviting me to present today. Um, and thank you for a fantastic lead off to a presentation. We did not collaborate in developing our presentations, but perhaps strangely enough, the universe is conspiring away in a way that I hope some of what I'm going to be talking about today will actually uh, complement and perhaps provide some explanations to so much of what you were discussing. So as Bill mentioned, um, I come from the University of Toronto in Canada. Uh, my initial degree was actually as a pharmacist. And I always like to tell the joke of what do pharmacists use for contraception? And the answer is their personalities. But perhaps, and, and there's a lawyer even here, seriously. Uh, but after completing a pharmacy degree, I actually did my PhD in psychology. Um, not clinical psychology, academic psychology. And so a lot of my research over the years has really um, tried to take my experience as a healthcare professional, as a pharmacist, and try to understand it through a psychological prism. And so I'm going to be presenting to you today is some uh, evolving research in the area of competence, however you want to think of that. I'd like to thank um, the Federation for sponsoring me to deliver this talk, but I would also like to thank the College of Optometrists of Ontario, which might seem a bit peculiar, but the College of Optometrists of Ontario, which is the regulatory body for the optometric professions in uh, my home province, they actually have a regulatory research fund that researchers like me um, actually can apply to. And so even though the work I did had nothing specifically to do with optometrists, it had everything to do with pharmacists, they are happy to sponsor this work, recognizing that optometrists, physiotherapists, pharmacists, nurses, physicians, we're all kind of in the same boat. And what somebody from one profession learns can be broadly applicable to another. And it's kind of nice in this day and age of interprofessional collaboration to think that we have friends within and outside of our professions. This topic of friendship is actually going to be a theme of the next half hour or so of my presentation. And we have here a quote from Muhammad Ali that says, friendship is the hardest thing in the world to explain. It's not something you learn in school, but you have, if you haven't learned the meaning of friendship, you really haven't learned anything. Friendship is not the sort of thing we talk a lot about in professional circles. Um, Jerry alluded to the idea that, you know, nurses are humans as well, and people, people who need people are the luckiest people of all whatever it is we want to say, but the idea of friendship, professional practice, regulation, and competence, and a strange intersection that appears to be percolating in all of this is something I'd like to explore today. And so for those of you who are wondering what kind of a voyage am I taking you on, these are the kinds of things that I hope we'll be able to actually discuss today. Talking about a, an evolving concept of competency drift not competency, but competency drift. Talking about a uh, relatively newfangled concept in the psychological world of something called learnworthiness. And then thinking about how these uh, concepts can perhaps influence your work and some particular and very specific strategies around peer-based competency assurance mechanisms. So of course, because this is about competence, we need to think a little bit about what competency is. and. Uh, it's oftentimes said that every way of seeing something is a way of not seeing something else. Um, in my world of academic psychology, we sometimes say, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And the question then becomes, when you as regulators see and think about competency and incompetency, what are the blinkers that we are all wearing? What are the um, biases or unstated assumptions we have 
Is competency a personality defect? Is competency something that makes us feel embarrassed about someone? And so we just want to push them away as far as possible so they don't taint our profession and our reputation. Is competency something that is a person's fault? Or does it just happen to them and therefore we should help them? The idea that a word changes meanings over time is something we're all very, very familiar with. And so, for example, we can think of concepts like mental illness, where 200 years ago, mental illness was thought to be the purview of spiritual possession. And so what would happen, like if, if somebody demonstrated symptoms of mental illness and some of the perhaps bizarre behaviors at the time, well, clearly you're possessed. Call in a priest. But later in more enlightened Victorian times, Mental illness wasn't about spiritual possession. It was about criminality. I don't care what you're doing, but we're going to throw you in jail because you're going to be a risk to yourself and to other people. And then later on in the 20th century, we start to recognize that mental illness is actually more about chemical imbalances and a medical condition. Don't call a priest. Don't call a police officer. Call a pharmacist. Get some pills. It's all going to be okay. In our own lifetimes, there has been a breathtaking change in our understanding of, for example, a concept like homosexuality. Is it a sin? Is it a crime? Is it simply human variation? And today, I would suggest, there is evolving work to, to, to give us the idea that our understanding of competency is changing quite a bit. Is it a sin? Is competency a crime? Or is incompetency simply a kind of variation that we haven't quite got our heads around in terms of what we should be doing with this? The reality is, as regulators, as educators, as employers, as risk managers, and specifically as lawyers, we have become extraordinarily focused to the point perhaps of fixated on some very narrow definitions and understandings of competence sometimes to the exclusion of concepts like quality or excellence. What we know from the literature is that competency actually means different things to different people. What's very, very clear in the literature is that when you talk to the recipients of care, whether you call them patients or clients, the three A's is what dominates the view of competency. When people think about a competent physiotherapist, a competent pharmacist, a competent whoever, they tend to describe it in terms of three different terms. Available, affable, and acknowledgement. A, some, a person is competent to me as a patient if they're there when I need them. I don't want to have to wait two weeks. I don't want to have to wait a, a year. I want them to be there when I need them. That is competence. I want them to be nice. I want them to be conversational. I want them to be pleasant and make me feel good. And I want them to actually listen and acknowledge what I am saying. Conspicuously absent from this list of three A's is perfect or accurate. And most studies of patients actually say patients are extraordinarily forgiving of human error and genuine mistakes so long as there is an apology and explanation and actually an attempt to make things right. Educators like me oftentimes think about competency in a different way. And what has dominated the world of education over the last 20 years is math. We talk about competence in terms of, uh, of R, R factors and defensibility coefficients and G weightings, reliability and validity, as though a mathematical formula can define whether or not somebody is competent. A very different perspective on the word than patients have. We have a very antagonistic kind of legal and regulatory structure that, of course, from a lawyer's perspective, means you are either competent or you are not. In the same way that, well, you can't be kind of pregnant, you can't be kind of competent. You either are or you're not. And so much of what we struggle with, particularly in a regulatory context, is this notion that it's an either or. From an employer perspective, Competency is all about creating interchangeable widgets that fit into standard operating procedures. 
We have timelines. We have measurements. We have workload statistics that need to be collected. And we just need to make sure that that these people can fit into whatever kinds of metrics we have as an organization that govern what we think is important. What all of these perspectives really have in common, again, is that somewhat binary conception of competence. You either are or you're not. What has been, until recently, missing from the academic literature in this area is actually understand from a practitioner perspective, what do practitioners like me and like many of you actually think competence is all about? And what some of this research has actually pointed to is that competency is not a discrete or stable state. It is a continuum. If you are a physiotherapist, you know perfectly well that your competence varies, if not day to day, moment to moment. You could wake up in the morning and you had a terrible night's sleep. You have a fight with your spouse. Your kids are bugging you. You have a terrible amount of traffic. Everybody's really irritating. And now you're showing up to work and you're supposed to say, hi, I'm your generic healthcare professional. How can I help you today? Well, no way, no thank you. I am just in a rotten mood. And in that moment, perhaps I'm not competent. The idea that competence is a binary, it's like citizenship or blood typing, you either are or you aren't, is not at all resonant with most practitioners. They know it depends on, oh my goodness, who else is working with me today? And I can certainly say as a pharmacist, when I used to work clinically um, at a large teaching hospital in Toronto, I know, oh my goodness, who are the residents that are working today? Because you know the quality of your working life is very dependent on everybody else. Some of the research that was sponsored by the College of Optometrists of Ontario that focused on pharmacists in Ontario highlighted a very interesting um, finding. Interesting in one sense, but completely obvious in another sense. And that is the idea that GASP, professional competency problems, are actually closely connected to personal competency issues. Where people have a bad day, but then the next day is fine, usually they don't run into difficulty but we know that people lead difficult lives sometimes. There are lots of complications in our day-to-day -day existences and the bleeding over of personal life into professional life is inevitable. But research in pharmacy, in family medicine, in a wide variety of professions has demonstrated is that where regulators are called to make judgments about the competency of their members, there are certain risk factors that are consistently identified time after time as being, if not predictive, at least indicative of individuals at highest, highest risk of being called incompetent by their regulator. These risk factors include, first, age. Those who have been in practice 25 years or more are at higher risk of being called incompetent by their regulator. The second risk factor is type of practice. People who work by themselves in solo practice are at higher risk of being called incompetent than people who work with other people. In a profession like pharmacy or physiotherapy, that is a huge finding because you know lots of, lots of pharmacists practice in their pharmacy alone. Lots of physiotherapists work by themselves. The third risk factor is place of graduation. And that's not to say that a Florida law school is better or worse than any other law school, but it is to say that if you happen to be what we in Canada call an internationally educated health professional, you are going to be at higher risk of eventually being called incompetent by your regulatory body. And the fourth risk factor is a Y chromosome. In males are at higher risk of being called incompetent by the regulatory body than females. As our research was trying to understand this data and connect it to some interviews that we were doing with pharmacists who had been called incompetent by our regulatory body, a certain common denominator started to emerge. And that common denominator was loneliness, was isolation. People who work by themselves in solo practice are by definition isolated. People who didn't graduate from here don't have the same social connections as people who did graduate from here. 
Men are typically more isolated than women. All of these types of intersecting factors started to lead us down the path to suggest that a common but un under discussed core to competency drift was actually isolation. This concept that competency is not a binary, it's not today I'm competent, tomorrow I'm not competent, but it's a process that happens over a period of months and years where you just gradually start to become untethered from competency has parallels I'm sure that we can all relate to in our own lives. And I'd like to share a personal example of a non-professional context of my own competency drift. And it has to do with music. So uh, if you are of my, of my vintage, you will know that uh, in the 1970s, music was really important to young people. People would get, like, kids would buy LPs. I hope all of you know what an LP is. It is a large vinyl disc that you, okay. Um, some of you looked a little bit too young to know what that is, but, but music was consumed through LPs. Groups of kids would get together in somebody's basement and say, hey, I got this, uh, I got this record, let's listen to it together. And that's what you would do. And as a young person growing up in the 1970s, records and music and the way you interact with your peers around music was a big part of what defines social competence. Your friends were the kind of people, were you really into disco or were you really into rock or were you really into pop, like whatever it was, whatever categories you want. Around that time, other technologies were, uh, came and went, for example, the cassette tape, the eight track, but they all had in common this notion that there was a physical thing that you put in or on another thing and you press the button and music appeared and was collectively consumed. Most of my childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood, this was a big part of what young people did, listen to music. And then somewhere around the mid-1980s, thanks a lot, Bill Gates, things changed, and suddenly a new technology emerged, something called a compact disc. A compact, I could get my head around a compact disc because it was like a tiny record. It was shiny, it was round. What was weird about a compact disc, though, was that you put it into a slot and it disappeared. You actually saw a record spin around. You actually saw spools on a cassette tape spinning around. But this compact, this thing was a little bit odd, but it was still round and it was, a, it was actually a thing. And then suddenly around 1990, my world collapsed. Because if you remember around 1990, 1992, something got introduced called an MP3 player. Suddenly, there was not a thing. There was not a disc, a record, or a cassette. You had to go to some newfangled contraption called the interwebs. You had to have some weird little device. You plugged things into different things. You had to do something called downloading. There was this file that had to go somewhere, and it's like, what? And... That was the point music died for me. And so to this day, I will tell anybody under the age of 50 that the best music came from the 70s and 80s. And like, you know, Nirvana, what's that? Duh, forget all of those kind of groups. But the idea here is that a major technological change in the way that which music was actually produced and consumed occurred. And maybe through my own fault, maybe through no fault of my own, this was just weird. It didn't look like anything I had ever seen before. It did not behave the way I needed it before. And I had enough LPs, eight tracks, cassettes, and CDs that I didn't need to go out and start to listen to more music. And then over the years, because I missed one very important technology, now there's things like Spotify. And I, I, I don't know what that is. And again, music stopped for me in about 1992 as a result. Now, I could have been perhaps brave at the time and said, what is this? How, how do I actually get music on this device? But of course, life happens. It, you know, just, it wasn't that important. I had the music that I wanted and it was absolutely fine. The point, of course, of all of this um, 
is I don't even know what kids do anymore for music. But one thing that is very different is that kids don't actually listen to music collectively anymore. Instead of sitting in somebody's basement and everybody gathering around and listening to the same record, when people say, hey, let's listen to music, everyone is sitting with their iPhones and their own little earbuds, and they're just sitting beside each other, listening to their own music, not interacting with one another whatsoever. This is my own story of competence drift with respect to music, but I think it's very reflective of the kind of competency drift that practitioners uh, experience. The leap from an LP to a CD wasn't hard to make, but then something happened in the environment that I just couldn't be bothered with, was intimidated by, didn't have anybody to ask to help me with it. At a certain point, it became embarrassing to say, I don't know how to use this because the technology had moved on. But oops, because I've missed out on how to use an MP3 player, now I don't know how to do anything with respect to music anymore. And it just happened to me. It wasn't malicious, it wasn't deliberate, and it wasn't anything that I planned. But the net result of it is that by any objective standard, I am completely incompetent now when it comes to music acquisition. If we think about the rapid evolution of any profession in 2023, the exact same thing is happening with many of our practitioners. Pharmacy is an, an, an exceptionally, I think, interesting profession to study right now, not so much in the United States, but, but in Canada. Because what's been happening in the Canadian um, scene is we have a, a, a single payer universal healthcare system. Um, and what that means is that right now in a post COVID world, our primary healthcare systems are collapsing under the weight of human resource shortages, increased demand, increased amounts of funding, et cetera, et cetera. And across Canada, the response of governments has been to say, oh my goodness, we don't have enough family doctors. What are we going to do? We're going to let pharmacists do things. And so now across Canada, pharmacists are prescribing everything under the sun. Pharmacists are ordering lab tests. Pharmacists are providing referrals to other healthcare professionals. Pharmacists are doing injections left, right, and center. That's all well and good. And as someone who teaches pharmacists, I'm very happy to say, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're competent to do that. No way in hell I'm competent to do any of that. Simple example for me is injections. If you got your COVID jab from a pharmacist, which probably many of you did, you're welcome, but you sure weren't going to get it from me because I specifically became a pharmacist because I never wanted to touch people. And I never wanted to actually, like, I don't like to get needles. Why would I want to give somebody a needle? And in the same way that LPs became CDs, uh, became MP3s, became Spotify, now all of a sudden the profession that I signed up for ain't the profession that's happening now. So much has changed. And almost any profession you can think of today, there's so many changes in scope of practice and expectations in the job itself. And one of the reasons why those in practice 25 years or more are at risk of competence drift is because but that's not the job I signed up for. And I can ignore it for a while. I can internally fume and rail and say, I'm not going to ever do that. But at a certain point, your profession outgrows you. And where do you go to get help? This then starts to actually raise some questions about whether incompetence is the real problem we're trying to solve. A binary of competent or incompetent means that by the time somebody is called incompetent by their regulatory body, it's kind of too late. What we really need to do is actually think about why it is that people drift from competence what regulatory levers in particularly are available to help people not drift from uh, competence, and how all of this actually intersects with the busy day-to-day -day life that all professionals actually live. What we do know is that most of the things that unfortunately educators and regulators have relied upon in order to help people maintain competence actually don't really work. And top of that list is compulsory continuing education. Apologies to any of you who are still using the, you have to do 20 hours or 25 hours a year of continuing education and fill out forms, and that's how we know that you're competent. But for at least 25 years, there's been evidence that suggests that there is no translation of compulsory continuing education 
into maintenance of competence. We know that complaints-driven processes, which all regulatory bodies rely upon, don't really work to prevent uh, competence drift. We also know that unfacilitated or unmonitored reflective practice techniques. We ask someone, keep a learning portfolio, but you don't do anything to help them to do that. That doesn't help people to maintain competence. We're pretty confident that fear-based assessment systems, for example, secret shoppers, for some reason in the Australian regulatory uh, community, they love secret shoppers, sending actors into healthcare professionals' offices with like all wired up for sound um, and to see what are you actually doing when you don't know if this person is an actor or a, uh, or a real patient. But fear-based assessment systems don't really work to help people prevent competency drift. And nor does fear of being labeled incompetent by your regulator actually prevent competence drift. So what then can regulators do? The reality is that most of us, if we're around long enough, are going to start to experience at least some of the risk factors for competence drift. What can regulators do to actually help to slow down, prevent, or perhaps even reverse that process of drift? And for this, I would like to introduce you, if you've not met her already, to a psychologist by the name of Judith Rich Harris. Judith Rich Harris has a fascinating personal story, if you've not heard of her. She was a, uh, a student in the PhD program in psychology at Harvard University in the 1980s. Very early on in her program, she was, it was thought that she didn't have the right stuff to do a PhD in uh, psychology at Harvard. At that time, the psychology department was incredibly testosterone rich very male dominated, very competitive, um, as, as, as odd as this might sound, a very macho academic uh, psychology kind of institution. And she was asked politely to leave the program. She was one of a handful of women um, enrolled at that time. 10 years after being booted out of that program, she won the American Psychological Association Award for the best scientific paper in psychology for a paper that was focused on something called group socialization theory. It was a paper called Where is the Child's Environment? And it is one of the most impactful papers in all of psychology today. It became an airport book called The Nurture Assumption, which some of you may have read at some point. And I share this story for a couple of reasons. First, so much of what motivated Judith Rich Harris was this sense of profound isolation and alienation she felt being in a very male-dominated, disrespectful academic department. Um, some of her tenacity in overcoming those kind of structural issues, and ultimately the impact of her work, not just in, for psychologists, but also ultimately, I hope to demonstrate today, for regulators as well. Her work pioneered development of something called group socialization theory. And drawing on her own experience, which was very devalued at that time in the 1980s, as a young mother trying to get a PhD in psychology, she asked a very provocative question. And that question was, do parents have any long-term effects on the development of their child's personality? If you are a parent, you know this is a question that almost all parents obsess over. Am I doing right by my kid? Is my kid learning less of something? Does my kid even listen to me? Like, where is my kid coming from and who are they going to become and what is actually really, really important? There were many things that her studies pointed to, and some of it's a little bit of psycho mumbo jumbo, which I won't necessarily read. But one of the most impactful quotes from the article that won that American Psychological Association Best Paper Award of 1995 is this line. What group socialization theory implies is that children would develop into the same sort of adults if we left them in their homes, their schools, their neighborhoods, and their cultural or subcultural groups, but switched all the parents around. There was a little bit of a gasp when I said that, because of course this is every parent's worst nightmare. Because on some level, I think we all know this, right? That after a certain point, parental influence on childhood trajectory is extraordinarily limited. And what Rich Harris's work pointed to was that the most important decisions parents actually make 
is in setting a very loose perimeter around which children make friends. So the decision that you as a parent makes in terms of the neighborhood you live in actually means these are the kids that your, your child is being exposed to and the population from which they will choose friends. You can try to make your kid into an, a hockey player, but maybe he really wants to be a ballet dancer and you can't really change that. What this somewhat depressing but very enlightening theory pointed to was the idea that in childhood and adolescent development, the most impactful influence on adult outcomes was peers. And if you're a parent, you know that. You know the only question that you really think about is, who is my kid hanging out with? Who are their friends? Because that is the predictor of where they are going to go in life and what kind of things they're going to get up to. Rich Harris's work was very much focused on children and adolescents. But as we were trying to think through this idea of the finding that professional isolation seems to be a core to competence drift, it seemed that this theory may have some applicability to understanding competence and competence drift. We start with the reality that the lives of all working professionals, every single one of this in this room and every single person that you regulate is busy, complex, and sometimes chaotic. It is hard in 2023 to have any kind of a job, particularly a professional job. And what that means is that in any environment you go to today for a professional, there is far too much information in the environment to actually process, digest, integrate, and incorporate. Somebody's telling me this, my boss is telling me that, a professional association is telling me this, a journal is telling me that, a peer is telling me this. You are bombarded with lots of different things. As a result, choices, either conscious or subconscious, are constantly being made as to what we should pay attention to and what can be safely ignored. And in the context of competence drift, what we wanted to do is understand what influences these choices. What's the primary filter through which we actually decide what is worth learning? And this is where the concept of learnworthiness comes from. It grows out of Rich Harris's work, and it describes the process by which children and all human beings filter environmental and contextual cues and information around them. It's based on the concept that we all have a maximum bandwidth, and we have to filter what is to be believed, what is worth focusing on and what is actually important. We know that there are lots of different things that go into different bits of memory, working memory, short-term memory, long-term memory. And what this theory suggests is that the most profound filter for what ends up in long-term memory are actually peers. It's not me as a professor or a researcher. It's not you as a regulator. It's not Vanderbilt as an employer. It's certainly not Chuck as a lawyer. What people actually filter and think about is what is important is what their peers are doing. Why did I never learn how to use an MP3 player? Because when I looked around, everybody my age who were my friends, none of us were doing that. And so, well, none of them are doing that. I guess it's safe for me not to learn how to use that as well. This really then has led us down this path of thinking about the role of peers in continuous professional development. Where does the psychological energy required to want to remain competent actually come from? This is a critical question. It's idealistic to think that I'm a physiotherapist and I'm a professional and I really want to do all that's best for my patients. Sure. When I don't have to worry about the economy, traffic, my kids, this, that, the other, sure, I can be altruistic. But in a ruthlessly Darwinian world of multiple competing priorities, I got to look after myself, Jack. And that means I have to decide who am I going to listen to. The idea that we need some form of engagement, some kind of psychological fuel to maintain our competence, to continuously engage in lifelong learning, led to a quote from one of the papers that came out from this project. And that was uh, a pharmacist who had been found incompetent by our regulator, told us in our interviews, you gotta give us a reason to want to be competent. 
not just a reason to be afraid of you calling me incompetent. And this then becomes potentially an opportunity where peers can have an extraordinarily important role. If I'd had peers who were keeping up with things and actually using MP3 players, I could have watched them. I could have asked them questions. I could have realized, oh, everybody else is doing this. I better pull up my socks. If a person has peers who are saying, oh, yeah, I'm a pharmacist and we never used to inject, but now I'm giving injections left, right, and center. Oops, I guess I better go ahead and do that. It's a completely different thing when an employer, a regulator, an academic, or a researcher tells you you need to do something. But when there are people that you self-identify as your peers doing something, that becomes the learn-worthy filter that makes you think, oh, I think I better pay attention and do something about this. Across many health professions today, we're seeing a rapid proliferation of what are called peer-based competency systems. The idea being that regulators are saying and cottoning on to this notion that, you know what, we can't tell people what to do, but other, but your peers can tell you what to do. And while I think this is an important development in most of the systems that we've studied so far, there's a fatal flaw to them. And that is, it's the regulator telling somebody, this is your peer. That's the equivalent of a parent saying, look at Johnny, Johnny should be your friend. Johnny plays the violin and volunteers the folk group and has a GPA of 4.0 and is learning how to you know, do all these. Things. You should be Johnny's friend. You cannot dictate to anybody who their peer is. And so peer-based competency systems that try to engineer peer relationships have a fatal flaw embedded in them. Where we've actually seen peer-based competency in many professions is through, for example, things like peer assessments, peer mentoring, peer site visits. But where these peer relationships are socially dislocated, where the person who is being sent by a regulator in the guise of being a peer, I don't even know that person, well, then it's not going to actually work. And why it doesn't work goes right back to Muhammad Ali. Because at the core of this is the strong human need for friendship. And it's not something we talk a lot about in a professional context. But the role of friends in helping us to maintain competence is something that we have really not tapped into in the most powerful way imaginable. Now, it is very important when you go down this path to distinguish between introversion and isolation. I say this as a self-admitted introvert, and I suspect many of you are also introverts. Introverts are not individuals who are necessarily isolated. Introverts learn a great deal by quietly watching people do things. They may not be dancing around with lampshades on their heads at parties, but introverts are not necessarily isolated. What our study of incompetent pharmacists pointed to was a very clear pattern of gradual isolation of individuals called incompetent from their professional peers. At some point, we actually started asking them, can you name some friends who are pharmacists? And a large number of them didn't have a single nameable friend who shared their profession. There's a bit of a chicken and egg here, of course, and it's hard to know if, a, if you know causation and correlation are not necessarily proven by this, but this notion that where professionals don't have friends professionals don't have peers and professionals are isolated, that is an enormous risk factor for competence drift. Is there a role for regulators and others to use nudging techniques to help support development of professional friendships? Is there a risk that needs to be managed? Because what if isolated individuals who have antisocial or anti-professional attitudes find one another? And, oh yeah, I got a friend, but it's not the kind of friend we want them to have. There are many, many issues, and I, I hate to keep coming back to a parenting analogy because that sounds very paternalistic, but there are many issues in all of this, but at the core of it is this explanation that competency drift and isolation are associated with one another, and that if there are ways of reducing isolation, we might provide individuals with the psychological and social energy they need to maintain their own competence. 
One potential model that is evolving rapidly in the Ontario reg regulatory context has been the evolution of peer circles. And there's a couple of different professions, and the one I'm most familiar with is actually the profession of dental hygiene, where the regulator is taking a very assertive role in using their, their bully pulpit to construct opportunities for individuals, particularly those working, those individuals working by themselves, to routinely connect with true peers and have discussions about practice-based problems. This is not something that is engineered. This is not something that is particularly structured. It's simply facilitating opportunities for individuals who are isolated in their practice to share experiences with one another, and perhaps in the process, start to build the kind of peer networks that are, uh, that are useful. Regulatory levers in this context can be used to drive initial attendance, but then after that, we hope, it'll actually become self-perpetuating when people actually see and find others who are having similar issues that they are and have a safe space that is not monitored by the regulatory body, that is not actually um, driven by regulatory interests. The idea is this is a way of helping to prevent small problems from becoming big problems. The idea behind the peer circle approach is that it's easier to build a fence than to call an ambulance when someone's once someone's fallen off a cliff. If we are to believe this theory of the psychological underpinnings of competence maintenance and the important role of learnworthiness and peers in that, then it becomes a regulatory responsibility to find ways of ensuring every single registrant has peers. It uh, becomes a regulatory opportunity to use the levers that are available to connect people to one another in a way that may inoculate them from the worst uh, harms of competence drifts. So in the final couple of moments of the presentation before we go to the panel discussion, this may be a somewhat strange concept to get your head around, certainly in a, in a regulatory system that has evolved in a somewhat litigious, antagonistic, and prove to me that you're competent type of a model. But again, if we're thinking about safety and public interest, we want to prevent small problems from becoming big problems. And what is clear in the literature is that there are risk factors associated with competence drift that are linked to isolation. If we think about isolation as a characteristic that we want to try to do something about, whether peer circles are the right intervention or not, I don't know. But the idea is that if we think from a regulatory perspective about isolation as something that needs to be better managed to prevent and to inoculate individuals from competence drift, there may be some interesting opportunities to consider different ways of authentically engaging peers. Ultimately, this kind of approach, I hope, will help us to think about ways of reducing legalistic, bureaucratic, or antagonistic relationships between the regulated and the regulator. Finding safe spaces for disclosure of known competence gaps while they are still manageable is what this is really focused on. And it's using the regulatory levers that we have available in perhaps a more proportionate and constructive way focused on relationship building. Of course, while I say to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, this is kind of an academic flavor of the month right now in competency circles. And so there's a bit of bandwagonism about it. I in no way think that this is the be all and end all or to sell you this as a concept. But I do firmly believe, as I've gotten more immersed in this, that thinking about isolation as a characteristic is absolutely necessary. It's necessary, but insufficient. I don't know that as a regulatory educational community, we've spent enough time thinking about this. And I hope after today, we'll have opportunities to think and discuss more about this. And so in summary, before we move to the panel discussion, what I hope this presentation has done is give you some food for thought in terms of a psychological perspective on competence drift, and perhaps identified a unique role and opportunity for true authentic peers, not engineered peer relationships, but authentic peer relationships, and thinking about the notion of inoculating every registrant against the worst possible impacts of competence drift. And if you're interested in reading more, here are some references for you. Thank you so much for the invitation to come today and for your interest and attention to this. I look forward to the panel discussion.